Welcome to Channel 3 News, reporting tonight from Jerusalem. Jesus of Nazareth, controversial itinerant preacher, alleged miracle worker, and nemesis of the Jewish religious authorities, was crucified today. In a remarkable reversal of fortune, the ruling council came up with an unprecedented midnight, some experts say illegal conviction, just five days after he received a tumultuous welcome to the city by thousands of jubilant Jews. In an odd twist of fate, the man whom John the Baptist called the Lamb of God died just as the Jews were sacrificing their paschal lambs on the great temple's altar, a centuries-old ritual. Details of an extraordinary day from our own reporter, Ardelia. This is Ardelia reporting live from Jerusalem. It was a day full of fearsome occurrences that this city will not soon forget. From noon till 3 p.m., while Jesus and two other men were writhing on their crosses, it became dark as midnight outside and torches had to be lit. It was not an eclipse, but it was eerie in the extreme. I was at the scene of the crucifixion on Golgotha, and just as Jesus breathed out and cried his last, this massive earthquake shook the city. These huge rocks were split apart like dropped melons, and the taunts and jeers of those watching the gruesome spectacle suddenly turned to cries of alarm. Some thought the world was coming to an end. I overheard one of the centurions in charge exclaim to the terrified guards that surely this man was the Son of God. Across town at the temple, thousands of terror-stricken worshipers fell to their knees as the earth shook under them. This massive, thick curtain that screened the Holy of Holies was ripped apart with a deafening noise that drowned out the screams of women and children on the temple mount. One of the priests exclaimed that it ripped in two from the top down as if some giant hand had just come and ripped it apart. And if that were not enough panic for one day, there have been numerous sightings, unconfirmed at this hour, of known dead holy men up and walking the city streets. According to eyewitnesses, the man that led authorities to Jesus of Nazareth in this very place that I'm standing last night was one of his closest associates, a man named Judas Iscariot. According to those who knew him best, none of whom were willing to go on record, of course, he was an enigmatic mixture full of altruism and selfishness, devotion and duplicity, a pretty typical citizen. Actually, pan over here, bring the camera up here. You're Judas. You're Judas Iscariot. You look like a tormented man, and for good reason, I hear. How do you justify your traitorous act to the world? What do you say for what you've done? Speak. You want me to speak? No matter what I say, you've already condemned me. You're a sorry-sounding sinner with that holier-than-thou tone of voice. Who gave you the right to judge me? Judas, the world is watching. You won't get a better chance than this to justify what you've done. Do you know what it is to long for recognition, for acceptance? Do you know that awful lonesome feeling of being an outsider? You know, in my whole life, no one's ever come up to me and said, Judas, it's good to see you. I just wanted so badly to be somebody special. Is that so strange? Haven't you ever had longings like that? I bet you have or you wouldn't be where you are today. But with me, it began an obsession and I'd pay any price, any price whatsoever. Okay, okay, here's the story. I'm not asking for forgiveness. I'm beyond forgiveness. Let my life be a warning. There's nobody out there who's not capable of doing the same thing I did. It all began so well. I was born in Kerioth in Judea, home of God's chosen people, home of the holy city, home of God Almighty's magnificent temple, and I alone was a true Israelite. The others, the other disciples were from Galilee. From Galilee, whose only claim to fame is that nothing good ever came from it. I was the only one of the bunch with a resume worthy of the job. That's why Jesus made me treasurer. Unlike all Jewish parents, mine were ecstatic at the thought of having a male child. And when I was born, my father proudly exclaimed to the world, his name shall be called Judas, which means praised of God. Did you know that, Judas? praised of God. Well, I was raised like every Judean boy. I was taught to fear God and to await the promised deliverer. And that's what attracted me to Jesus the first time I met him. He had that he had that aura of authority. I'd heard him speak on several occasions. And then that magnificent day when he 
delivered that sermon from the mountainside. And I just stood there, I was transfixed. At the completion of it, he just walked up to me and he looked deep into my eyes and he said, Judas, follow me. Well, I did. Can I say, he was irresistible. Jesus chose me. And he chose a few of the others as well. And I had the purest, noblest intentions when I shouldered my knapsack that day. Why did he choose you? Why would he choose you or you? You know, only Jesus knows. He, every word that he spoke, we just hung on the edge of it. And when we weren't in his presence, we, we used to argue about when the, the time, the revolution would begin. And what changed? I mean, what came over you that led you to do such a horrible thing? I, I don't know. It was a gradual thing. I mean, you know, we live like vagabonds and paupers, and somehow dissatisfaction and impatience just crept in. And with the passage of time, it was a horrible lifestyle, and no move on Jesus' part to declare his kingship in Israel, I just grew more and more disenchanted. My old greedy ways returned. As treasurer, I had access to the bag, and I began to pill for coins, always intending truly to, to pay them back, but somehow I never did. And Jesus saw the change in me. And he told me, no, he warned me, Judas, beware of covetousness. A man's life is not measured by what he has, and there's nothing hid that shall not be made known. Well, as, as terrible as my greed was, it was nothing compared to my desire for recognition. I mean, I hungered for that more than I hungered for food. Yet people laughed at us, mocked us, chased us out of town, called us names. I mean... I'd given up everything, and these people made me feel like the scum of the earth. The folks we hung out with, the down-and-outers, the lepers, the poverty-stricken hordes dogged us day and night. And when we would complain to Jesus, he would always say the same thing. My job is to do the will of my Father. How do you argue with that? Well, finally I got up my nerve, and I decided to make my move. I see, I figured it this way. If he was truly the Messiah, then his legion of angels would protect him from anything. And if he wasn't, well, then he deserved to be exposed. And the one who would expose him, his name would be broadcast through the name, through the land. And his name would be Judas. If I had something to say about him, I would be somebody. What about the money, Judas? The money. The money. The Sanhedrin sat on a hoard of money. What they were willing to pay for information was chicken feed. It was chicken feet compared to what I gave up for three years to walk with him. You know, they would have caught him sooner or later. He even said they would. So I set it all up with the chief priests, and I met the uh, disciples in the upper room for that last Passover meal. I was so nervous. I would never done anything like this before in my whole life. And just before the meal was served, Jesus did the most demeaning thing imaginable. He got down on his knees after he girded himself, and he washed our feet. You know, in our part of the world, to show the sole of your foot to another person is the most insulting thing you can do to them. Servants wash feet. Well, after he was finished, he said, but not all of you are clean. Well, I knew who he was talking about. And then he added, one of you will betray me. And just like the rest, I said, is it I, Lord? Well, I may have fooled the others, but I didn't fool Jesus. You see, my heart was beating so loud and so fast, I knew that I would be exposed. So when Jesus leaned towards me and said, what you do, do quickly, I got out of there. I mean, that man was reading every thought in my mind. Well, you know the rest of the story. Jesus allowed himself to be condemned in a trial that was the biggest travesty of justice that the nation of Israel had ever seen. Then he let them kill him in the most hideous way possible. They beat him, they spat upon him, they humiliated him, they mocked him. And then they scourged him. They ripped the flesh right off of his bones until he was almost unrecognizable and nearly dead and and then they crucified and he went like a lamb to the slaughter and I knew 
I knew I'd made a big mistake. Jesus was forever preaching about repentance and forgiveness. And I know I've sinned and I need to get down on my knees and repent, but I cannot bring myself to do it. You see, I've betrayed innocent blood. I've killed the Son of the Most High God. I can't forgive myself. How can I ask anyone else to forgive me? I took the money back and I threw it in their faces. But my guilt and my despair have consumed me and I just, just can't stand it any longer. I have my recognition now. The world will never forget my name. Well, you heard it here first, folks. More details on 3 News at 11. Back to you at the studio, Quintina.